Hi everyone, good afternoon from my side. Um, welcome to this webinar on the Protection Analytical Framework DEEP project and um, more specifically on using secondary and qualitative data for protection analysis. Uh, my name is uh, Frey van Herk. I'm a project manager for the Danish Refugee Council in managing this project. Um, so today we'll be talking to you about secondary uh, and qualitative data analysis for, for protection clusters. Um, and we will be talking to you about what we're doing as well as lessons learned um, that we have from working with the clusters. Um, before I start, I just want to hand over to uh, Francesco Michele from the Global Protection Cluster. Thank you, Frey. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Uh, good morning, yes, afternoon, you can. everyone. Thank you. Hello, good, good afternoon. afternoon. You're welcome. Good afternoon from here. We can. Amazing. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone, or afternoon. Uh, well, my name is Francesco Michele. I'm the protection analysis lead in the Global Protection Cluster. I will spend very few words and then I will leave it to this interesting. Um, webinar. Um, the couple of words I would like to spend is that I'm really thankful of the collaboration we have been having in the last year uh, between our protection cluster team and the colleagues of the Danish Refugee Council because we are, uh, as a protection sector, we are in a moment where we're really looking into our, how our protection analysis can be uh, harnessed, can be used better, can uh, actually um, be reinforced by our collective efforts. It's quite complicated because we know that protection data and information is hard to get, but there is a very wide range of information and, and data that is available that we probably are not using uh, the whole capacity of that data to actually show protection situation in the country. So since uh, specifically uh, on the pro global protection cluster side, uh, we have been um, interested in trying to look how we can be better in using secondary data uh, analysis, uh, uh, because beside data collection processes, it's fundamental also to understand and qualify protection risks and to understand better the situation, not just a country level, but the nuances at community and local level, which is what we are much more interested in. So today's webinar is um, uh, is not a culmination, but uh, what uh, we have been asking the DRC colleague is to give us their opinion and lessons learned and inputs of um, coming from the support they give to five uh, protection clusters. Their work has been fundamental for us to develop protection analysis update, but has also been fundamental for the preparation we are doing for humanitarian needs overview and the contribution to the whole humanitarian project cycle. So without further ado, I really invite you to really take notes. I know the colleagues, they are great in, uh, in what they do, but also in explaining, and they're really, really open to comments, critics, questions. So without further ado, I, leave it, I give it back to Frey and, and enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Francesco. Um, so before we start, I just want to also um, introduce some other people on this call. So there's myself, I'm project manager for this PathD project. Um, and then uh, Francesco, who just spoke, um, our colleague from the GPC. Um, I also have a, here Noor Shamsaldin. So she is the senior analyst that is supporting two countries in East Africa, uh, two clusters in East Africa within this project. Um, my colleague Brennan Weber is online. He's the Global Protection Advisor uh, for Danish Refugee Council. Um, and we also have our dear colleague Dorian Klasnich from the Protection Cluster in South Sudan, um, who will be also showing some examples of the work that we're doing together. Um, last but not least, we have Fanny Delemer, who is our Senior Analyst for West Africa. She's supporting three clusters there, um, who will be joining this call later. Um, so again, welcome. Um, so as Francesco explained, we have been working for the past year or so together um, with um, our five protection clusters that we're supporting in uh, in the field. Um, and so here we are going to talk about what we have been doing, um, what we're doing in terms of secondary data analysis for protection, as well as lessons learned that we have from this process. And we hope that um, any of this information will also be useful to our other um, protection cluster colleagues, as well as anyone else who might be interested in doing more secondary or qualitative data analysis for protection. 
So uh, we'll be talking about um, what we're doing within this project and how this also aligns with um, the Global Protection Clusters um, analysis workflow that they have presented um, at the start of this year. Um, we will start first with what uh, are some of the outputs are from our secondary um, data analysis. So what type of products do we actually come out with? Um, as well as Dorian will give examples of um, how this works in South Sudan from um, the system that he has put in place. And then um, after we've done the examples and just showing you what it is that we do, we go more through the step by step as to how we actually get to this process, um, as well as then lessons learned um, on um, on using secondary data for protection analysis and some Q&A um, at the end. So without further ado, let's get um, going. So about this project. Um, so this project run, ran since um, October 2022, and we'll be um, finalizing this project in July um, of this year, so pretty soon. Um, and in gross uh, lines, let's say in, in uh, general terms, these are some of the main activities that we have been doing. So the first is protection analysis training. <clears throat> Sorry, let me actually rewind up a little bit. So the objective, let's start with that, was to strengthen protection analysis for protection clusters and then with the emphasis on using qualitative and secondary data to do this. So some of the main activities that we have done across the clusters um, are listed here and I will talk through them one by one, but just with the caveat of these are some of the general activities, but per cluster we have done different activities depending on their needs um, and particularly also for their own processes as to what they already had in place themselves or systems that have been set up within the clusters already. Um, so this is not the exact process in each cluster, but just to highlight what we have been working on in um, general terms. So protection analysis training um, for the clusters that we're supporting. So again, that is Ethiopia, Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali and South Sudan. We have been doing a training um, with selected participants on what uh, what is protection analysis. So what are we talking about in terms of protection analysis, the tools, um, many of which have been developed by the Global Protection Cluster and the AOR, such as the protection and local framework, obviously, um, the protection risk list that we'll be talking about a little bit more later. Um, so really training people on <clears throat> the basics and principles of protection analysis. Then um, from our side, what we have been doing is supporting on organizing and structuring the qualitative data for each cluster. We do this through a system called DEEP, uh, the Data Entry and Exploration Platform, which is an online platform that we're using to structure our data. Um, and we will be talking about this more later, um, but this is really where a lot of our support has come in in terms of bringing in qualitative and secondary data for protection clusters to do analysis. We have done coaching and mentoring sessions, so online sessions um, with protection cluster colleagues and interested um, members on um, similar principles of protection analysis, but also in preparation and lead up to joint analysis workshops. Um, and so within these sessions, we go over principles in more detail. So how do we actually use qualitative data? How can we structure it? How can we use this platform? Um, yeah, what can what can basically be done um, to to get through uh, uh, protection analysis? Then risk prioritization. So what we want to do is really hone in on um, a few protection risks that are prioritized in the cluster. Um, so per cluster, we need to come up with what are the priority risks, because as you know, there's many protection risks uh, and we cannot analyze in detail all of them. So we really first need to prioritize which ones we're going to do. So we have been supporting in this risk prioritization process for some of these clusters um, and trying to look at what is the best way to go about risk prioritization and seeing lessons learned from that for uh, for the protection clusters and GPC colleagues. And then workshops. So these have not happened yet, but will be happening soon um, in the countries where with uh, the cluster colleagues and invited participants, we are looking at five priority protection risks that we're going to be analyzing using all the data that we have gathered throughout this project um, and doing this together with them to have a joint analysis of these are the priority protection risks and this is how we have analyzed them and this is what we, um, yeah, what we think is the analysis on these risks. So 
this is the um, protection analysis workflow that for our cluster colleagues, I'm sure is familiar to you by now um, that has been presented by the GPC at the start of this year. I just wanted to show this slide just to highlight that what we're doing is aligning um, with the GPC analysis workflow that was presented for this year, where we're looking at risk prioritization. We're looking at data landscaping. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on and actually doing this analysis using again, all the data that we have available and um, that this analysis is also done. Um, these workshops that we're doing are going to be done uh, June, July, May, June, July, basically. Um, so also in lead up to the HNOs for this year to make sure that we're kind of aligning the sequencing of analysis with all the different products that need to happen. All right. OK, so more specifically, um, just about the quick outputs, so I'll, I'll show examples of this in the next slides. But um, basically, this list of protection risks, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you, is the list that has been produced by the GPC and the AORs, where we have um, more or less standardized protection risks that we are using for analysis. And so what we really have been trying to do throughout this project is to use these protection risks to um, prioritize within this 15 and to then do analysis on these risks in a joint manner based as well on this secondary data that then informs the um, analytical outputs of the clusters. So um, one of our main focuses has been a protection analytical update or analysis update that um, is, I'm sure, very familiar to our cluster colleagues. Um, but of course, as we keep saying, um, we think that this also can inform, for example, your strategic planning documents such as HNOHRP. So maybe just in a bit more detail, <clears throat> what are some of the products that we actually have been working on through this project? So. Um, the principal output, as I mentioned, have already PAUs. So at the end, um, after the workshops that we're going to be doing, we will produce a protection analysis update based on um, the discussions we will have had at these workshops. So these come out around June, July, based on the priority protection risks. And so we think because of the timing, this analysis can also be used within the HNO HRP. Um, but what we really want to kind of drive home is that the analysis um, is just a continuous process and continuous workflow. So what we are doing, for example, is um, next to this end product in this project, we also have um, more continuous analysis products that come out depending on the cluster, and depending on the needs. So these risk summaries you see, I will show an example in a bit more detail later on. Um, but what we can do is from this um, structured secondary data um, gathering that we keep doing in this online platform, we can, for example, produce summaries per risk. So we we take everything that we have and for each risk we can give like this is all the data that we have available. And so depending on the cluster, this could also be um, taken into ad hoc products. Um, some clusters have a more established workflow where every month there is an analysis report that comes out, um, can have different names. Um, some do it on a banner of protection monitoring. Others have more ad hoc products that come out and then the PAU from time to time. And then um, obviously every year there's the HNO process. So just depending on what is needed, we can use all our structured data that we have to put this into ad hoc products. So an example of this was um, in South Sudan where um, the cluster had to put inputs for the uh, report for the special pre representative on protection of civilians. And so we can go through, OK, what do we already have in terms of structured qualitative secondary data? And we can input that um, as is needed um, for a product like that. Other updates, obviously, as clusters, um, the cl cluster colleagues will know there's many other updates that need to happen, such as inputs into uh, into cluster presentations, ad hoc reporting, ad hoc um, analysis requests, sometimes for the HCT. Um, there's always a lot of requests for analysis. And so what we're trying to just demonstrate is that with having the structured process, we can pull the data when needed, um, but it's the same process. We just put it in different formats, really. Um, so it's not that every time that analysis needs to happen, we have to start from scratch. It's more how do we make this a continuous workflow within the cluster? Um, 
here is um, an example of a summary of protection risk. So basically what we do here, you see risk two attacks on civilians. Um, and basically what we do is we have these structured summaries um, that we do following the protection analytical framework. So we pull all the information and we structure it along um, the threat, the threat effects and capacities. So we're really using all the tools that are available at global level to kind of um, make sure that we have continuous updates on this. Um, so this is just an example of um, a product that we can, um, let's say, pool in an efficient manner. Um, so last slide before I hand over to my colleague to give uh, an example from, from the cluster. Um, but basically, um, as I said, what we're now going to be focusing on is doing these joint protection analysis workshops. And basically there we are pulling all the data that we have done from the qualitative side. We pull all primary data that colleagues may have available. Um, so this data can be either quantitative or qualitative from both sides. And then we gather people in the room to basically give their expert judgment and operational knowledge on all this data that we have. So that then results in the analysis of priority um, protection risks. So um, the analysis of the main risks that we have prioritized um, collectively as a cluster, which will then be put in different product formats. Um, so again, our end product after um, around July will be some of these protection analysis updates that will be done by cluster. Um, but there are other processes that are continuous ongoing because the cluster always is asked to do a lot of different products, but also has a continuous workflow. So I will ask my colleague Dorian from South Sudan to talk through the example of um, what the South Sudan cluster is actually doing um, in collaboration with our project as well. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Very well, thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to uh, structure this um, a little bit in a way from a perspective of an information management officer and uh, how my life <laughs> was uh, before the cooperation uh, we did, but also uh, before we introduced uh, a more structured uh, protection risk assessment also from the quantitative side of things, because the two the two things uh, live together now in South Sudan. So uh, my challenges uh, with quantitative data were, uh, were limited um, when it comes to coverage and limited uh, when it comes to uh, quantitative uh, uh, data. Um, I could use the num numerical, numerical part uh, but for the qualitative, we just did not have human resources capable to go and check uh, dozens of reports which were coming without any tagging, without any um, correlation. Just somebody had to read through them uh, and not being able to assess them against any fr uh, against any fr uh, framework. So yes, uh, a good uh, uh, an 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 analysis person could do that yearly. Uh, but not in a timely and 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 uh, accurate uh, fashion. As I said, frequently with the numerical data, we can deal with it monthly and quarterly. Um, but for the qualitative information, yearly was uh, was our limit. Um, Buying it is very important also because collection and storing uh, and and sharing of information and data in a cluster system uh, is also uh, challenging. Um, for the numerical data that we were collecting, the buy-in uh, has been increasing before we started doing this, uh, but it was rather complex uh, and majority of the products were not as well explained. So, you know, there were some buy-in, people were sharing uh, data, but, uh, you know, it was a little bit like pulling teeth. Uh, how, when it comes to quantitative, qualitative, uh, always requiring the requests, follow-ups and uh, uh, very hard to 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 get in a in a in a sustainable and timely manner. Uh, usability within the uh, HNO, uh, yes, very relevant, but with a limited uh, contextualization. And uh, the the data that we were collecting, qualitative for HNO was basically uh, non-existent. If we can if we can go to the next slide. 
So what we what have we done to mitigate this problem? So in 2021 already we started, and in 2022 we developed a protection monitoring system uh, which uses uh, key informant interviews uh, system. And at the moment we are also expanding it to also incorporate focal group discussions, observational methodologies. Uh, un uh, unified and harmonized household level interviews, rapid need assessment, and so and so forward, uh, which is uh, validated uh, and then visualized and shared uh, through a dashboard uh, and made available for analysts or reporting officers to see. Uh, we have established a group called Promo Protection Monitoring Working Group, uh, which is uh, which is comprised of at the moment about forty protection agencies uh, in the country. We, we are working towards expanding the pool of, of uh, members. Um, and basically, uh, uh, their key job is to produce a substantial number of various types of products. So from the protection analytical update, uh, a monthly uh, protection spotlight, uh, any other ad hoc advocacies, the narrative for the humanitarian needs and response uh, pro, uh, cycle, uh, the needs for the from the global uh, uh, protection cluster and AORs, national and subnational coordination, uh, together with five uh, with five Ws, our risk assessment would give us is also you know partially can also give us some sense of indication of impact. Um, and also, uh, uh, it is ha helping us with the uh, uh, needs and targetings within the HRP. What was missing, uh, 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 what we did not have last year, uh, was DEEP. Uh, and uh, when we started using DEEP, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side of the graph, uh, it basically gave context to our data. It's giving context to our data. It's uh, making our life uh, uh, much uh, e easier. So uh, now when we create products, uh, we have uh, a data analysis uh, and based on where we want to go with that particular product, uh, with the support from the from the uh, VS from the project, uh, we are now also receiving quantitative uh, uh, data, which is uh, well uh, uh, well defined and and well corresponds to the quantitative uh, data. Um, I just need to uh, in this particular graph, I just need to point one important aspect, and this is as you can see here, everything starts from a protection cluster member. So both the collection of the qualitative and the tagging and putting together the qualitative data. It comes, everything starts and finishes basically with the protection cluster members who then benefit from all the advocacy as well, of course. So uh, in the last several months, we have been uh, deploying a number of various types of uh, trainings. Um, the trainings on uh, qualitative data collection, on the new tools, uh, trainings on deep, trainings on reporting, Many, many, many actors, especially local actors, have uh, actually asked for support uh, for development of re reporting templates that are aligned with the uh, with the path, uh, which we believe it's also uh, very, very useful. Not only from the perspective of uh, storing the data, but also from the perspective of uh, the actual. A local level uh, analysis and local level understanding of the protection environment. Uh, I would even say that uh, uh, by using and deploying deep and uh, protection risk monitoring system, we have we are also not only uh, in, um, increasing the capacity to analyze protection risks in one country, but we are also building the capacity of uh, member staff protection officers in um, in having a, a better overview and better understanding of the protection environment, uh, how it relates uh, to the to the situation. Next slide, please. Now this is the same table, but uh, uh, now after this uh, project, I mean, many things are still ongoing, but we already see the results. We see uh, now that our area coverage has much extended because uh, sometimes where uh, where um, 
quantitative data is not collected in some areas, we, but we still have reports. So our geographical uh, knowledge has extended compared to the previous. Uh, it, we have a much better um, uh, and wider understanding of the context. Um, as you can see, the qualitative data information now, the timeliness aligns also with the quantitative. So we are now uh, able to uh, issue monthly uh, assessments of various types. Uh, Buy-in is increasing because um, many times uh, being able to talk about protection uh, uh, not only with the, with the quality, quantitative data, but also with uh, a concrete examples of things that are happening on the ground uh, does create a, 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 a more inclusive environment for the protection actors, members to be involved in the process. Um, and uh, we, uh, at the moment, we do believe that uh, DEEP is going to be uh, much more relevant uh, and will provide a wider contextualization for the uh, humanitarian needs overview, uh, but it still remains to be uh, tested for 2025. Uh, this is something which is in front of us in the next to come. Uh, personal level or at level of just IMO's day-to-day -day work, it is, uh, uh, so far it has been a, a, an amazing experience. Uh, really increased our uh, uh, quality of our reports, quality, uh, Timeliness of our reports, shelf life of our data, uh, we are much more accurate. Uh, and at the moment, we are uh, we are also looking into ways how to integrate this reporting into uh, a wider, not only advocacy um, channels existing in the country, but also concrete channels uh, within uh, within the intercluster cluster organization, which trigger responses. Uh, together with other clusters, um, we are looking into ways how to be better at uh, using this monthly uh, information to steer the centrality of the protection in the country. Uh, and we are also looking uh, into in ways how to do concrete geographical, thematical and activity prioritization with those avenues where protection cluster is involved, for example, the humanitarian fund in the country. Uh, thank you open for any questions, if there is any. Over to you. Great, thanks so much, Dorian. Um, if there are any questions, also feel free to um, post them at the end of the webinar otherwise. Um, but please, if there are any questions for Dorian specifically, um, feel free to. Yes, Mercy. OK, I see the hand has gone on. OK, so we can take some questions also at the end of the webinar. So uh, maybe we can continue and then um, please hold on to your questions and feel free to post them at the end. Um, so I think the process that Dorian is describing is, is just really interesting because um, from the protection monitoring um, system and the promo working group he's already set up, um, they really had a lot of the primary data. And so from our side, we could bring in more of the qualitative secondary data. And so um, I think, you know, the process that he's demonstrating that they're doing actually on, on a monthly basis is really like a mini joint analysis workshop almost every month. Um, and so there's really a lot of engagement with the partners, with the protection cluster members on making sure that the analysis is a collective and, and joint own process. Um, so it's a great way uh, or example of demonstrating how all these things can work together. So um, now that we have seen, OK, what is it that we're providing in terms of um, the qualitative and secondary data su support? How can this tie into a cluster process? And also, what are the products that are coming out? I just wanted to focus a little bit on how do we actually do this? So we're talking about using secondary or qualitative data, but how, how do we actually do this? Um, and so um, there are many different ways of breaking down these steps. I mean, there's the protection, information management uh, workflow. There's general IM workflows. For the sake of this webinar, I just kind of broke it down into three concrete steps, uh, which are understanding the different types of data and data sources, making a data landscape, and structuring and organizing your data against the political uh, protection analytical framework. 
Um, so let's look at it one by one. So the different types of data and sources of data. So I'm not going to go into too much detail because I know my protection cluster colleagues are um, very well versed in this, um, but we distinguish a few data types, let's say quantitative, so everything numerical, qualitative, in very simple terms, terms everything that is not numerical, um, could be observations, it can be um, responses to an interview question that is open-ended, it can be images, it can be anything really. Um, so in, in, in short, anything non-numerical really. Um, and so these are of course different data types. Now we have primary and secondary data as well. Um, quantitative data can be either primary or secondary and qualitative data can be either primary or secondary. So I know we're throwing these terms around a lot, so I just wanted to look at it in slightly more detail. Um, so primary data is data that is collected usually by yourself and or your organization where you have had the direct influence over the methodology, who has been targeted, etc. cetera. Um, so it could be, for example, protection monitoring. If you're administering that you know, yourself or your organization does, you know how many people are being interviewed, do you know what the questions are, you know how they're, you know, how it's been set up, etc. And you get all this raw data yourself, right? Um, and so it could also refer to um, a data set, for example, that has not yet been analyzed. So let's say um, Dorian has been collecting um, primary data through protection monitoring, but I have access to this database and nothing of that has been processed. I could say that I have access to primary data as well, even though I didn't collect it. Secondary data then is basically data that has not been uh, collected by you or by a different organization. So if um, if Dorian has done his protection monitoring and he has already looked at this data set and put this in a report and I only see the report, uh, obviously the report is based on primary data, but to me this is secondary data. So I have the report, but I don't know exactly what the actual data set says and I haven't collected it, etc. So it's secondary. Um, so we kind of refer to that as data collected by someone else or a different organization. So it could also be just primary data that has already been analyzed. So the example I just gave. So the definition between primary and secondary is not always super clear. What we see um, is that oftentimes people refer to quantitative data uh, alone as, as primary, um, but I think that definition depends a little bit. Either way, um, whether it's quantitative, whether it's qualitative, whether it's primary or secondary, we all we can use all this data for protection analysis. So um, what we're really focusing on is on the secondary data. So we do not collect data ourselves. We look at all the data out there um, and it could be quantitative, could be qualitative, but most of it that we're analyzing is qualitative. So um, just to make that clear. So the idea is in country as well that you need to know all your different data sources, whether they are primary, secondary, uh, quantitative or qualitative, but what is out there? So that leads us to the data landscape. Um, so some of the processes that we have done with some of our clusters is to really map out all these different sources. Um, how do we do that? Um, there are different ways of doing it, um, so I'm not here to, to say this is how you have to do it, um, but really generally the steps are kind of looking at all your sources in country. Um, and mapping these against a framework. So you could use, for example, a protection analytical framework or protection risks as a framework and just map all the different sources, after which you will identify what is actually in this source, what is in this data. Um, so here's an example of how we have done it um, with some clusters, which is we used the protection information management data landscape, let's say where we use the categories that were identified um, through this process. And so here's an example of just some data sources that we were mapping against this. So when we were talking about population data, so statistics, the number of IDPs, the number of refugees, this can be primary data, um, it could be secondary data, but it's mostly quantitative data, right? It's mostly numbers of people. Um, so for one country, we identified, okay, there is a DTM, and we know that UNHCR has their operational population data portals where we can also find this information. So we know we have these data sources. Um, for protection needs assessment, so any really needs assessment done by um, usually protection partners, right? Uh, we saw that some of them were primary data, um, sorry, some of them were quantitative data and some of them were qualitative data. So it could have been um, protection monitoring, which is 
leans more to the quantitative, but maybe we saw an assessment of focus group discussions, which is primary but qualitative. Um, so uh, we were trying to map out all these different assessments and asking partners what they have done and see if we can use that. Protection monitoring itself, obviously being a category, um, which in a lot of clusters uh, we do have protection monitoring, um, which is mostly quantitative, but there are also qualitative aspects usually, um, depending on whether the cluster admits it themselves, it could be primary, secondary. There's case management data, which often is also quantitative, some part of it's qualitative. Um, we know in some countries we have the GBV IMS, CP IMS, not that we can have access to all that data, of course, um, because it's protected as it should be, but there sometimes is a report that summarizes some um, overview of the GBV IMS, for example, once every quarter, um, so we use that, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we were really looking at, okay, what are actually our data sources in country? And we use this framework to kind of map that out. Another example, um, so this is from the GPC where um, I know it's a bit tiny, but um, here's an example of how within all the sources, each and every indicator um, that was in these sources has been mapped against the protection and local framework. So this part of the assessment, um, you can find the threats. This part of the assessments, you can find effects of the threats. This part of the assessment, you can find stuff about capacities. So there's different ways that you can map your data, um, but um, the idea is to at least have a good overview of all the sources in your context, um, their frequency, and how um, often you can use them. Um, so maybe just some quick lessons that we found through doing this is um, Obviously, all sources can be useful, um, but if you if we really go through all secondary data out there, there is actually a lot. Um, so we're not just looking at assessments from partners. It could be news reports. It could be research articles. It could be, um, you know, your local news updates. There's so much information actually out there. And so if you start to cover all of it, it can become quite overwhelming pretty quick. So we see that, um, you know, depending on the context, we can hone it down a little bit. Like um, if it's a more protected, protracted uh, longer term conflict, for example, we didn't think we had to follow the local news report every single day um, because the general lines of the context would not necessarily change. Um, however, if it is uh, a sudden onset, like if there is a um, an earthquake that just happened somewhere, then you have to rely much more on your day-to-day -day local news to map that out before an assessment is even done, before you even know what the needs are. So it depends a little bit on your context in terms of all the sources that you use and how uh, frequently. Um, but having said that, with some of the main sources that we use, we do need to keep up with the frequency of following these reports that come out. For example, following the protection monitoring if it comes out every month or every quarter, um, depending on the frequency, or following your latest TTM if it comes out every month, for example, just to make sure that you do keep up to date with structuring your latest data. Um, report sharing channels within the clusters. So within most clusters, uh, we did see that this exists, but um, sometimes we also think it can be strengthened. Um, so um, the sharing of assessments and information from partners through the clusters. So some clusters have mailing lists where they share resources that are being shared with them. Um, <clears throat> some clusters have it as more of a standing item on the agenda where partners are asked, you know, who's doing an assessment, what's going on, but to make sure that we remain up to date on what is actually coming out there from our partners as well. Um, and then deciding on the credibility of these reports. So, um, uh, for example, if we do use a lot of news media to also um, discuss within the people that are, you know, making summaries or bringing forward this qualitative analysis in terms of, okay, how credible are some of these sources? Um, if it could be, you know, uh, a local media that is much linked to the government and the government is an active uh, perpetrator of protection risks, um, then, you know, obviously we, we need to um, put some caveats as to what this what this report means or what what are they saying in this report and how true is this, right? Um, and then what we also um, see is that despite following all the assessments and everything in context, we do also need to find additional sources online. Um, Relief Web is a good website to go through, um, but it's not just 
you know, what we do as protection partners, but it's also the wider humanitarian community that has a lot of reports. So it could be OCHA, SIDREPS, um, that I know obviously are also shared through mailing lists and country, but to also just keep up to date with what wider partners are putting out there, whether that is a WASH report or food security or um, maybe even an investigative journalism piece or something that Human Rights Watch has written that contains a lot of information on drivers in the context, etc. Um, these are also just important to monitor. Um, so all in all, the qualitative data landscape um, and, or secondary data landscape in that sense can be quite large. So once we have our sources and we've mapped them um, and we keep up with them coming out, we obviously need to know what's in them. Um, so we need to read our sources, but we also need to keep what is relevant for our analysis and discard what is not. Um, so here is where there's a bit of a difference between how we process quantitative and qualitative data. So if we have a quantitative data set, which is again more numerical, obviously we use different programs to um, process that data than we would processing qualitative data. So quantitative data we use um, oftentimes more Excel, but also coding, Stata, R, etc types of programs to come up with graphs, to create dashboards, to consolidate figures into overall percentages, etc. Um, for qualitative data, this is different. Um, so let's say we have large pieces of text. How do we structure this in a way that we can pull it and use it whenever we need? Um, and this is what we do using the protection in a local framework. Um, I'm not going to go much into detail on this framework, but basically, um, this is a more, let's say, quantitative database. And if I filter out the data, I can get what I want. Um, I can go back to this data set and still always find what um, a household in this location has said. But in qualitative data, you have so many different reports and they're not structured in a similar manner. So we need to basically create our own database so that we can pull the data that we need when we need it uh, on, for example, a protection risk. So then it's like, okay, what did I say from this report on this risk? What did I say from that report? What did this partner say on this risk? Um, so I need to create basically my own database to pull what I need when, um, when we need to write something. So here's just an example of how we do this. So like I said, we need to structure data and we do this using the protection and local framework. But basically think of it as I have all these pieces of texts that I need to structure against the protection of the local framework. Um, if you do not know the protection of the local framework, I will show it in the next slide, but I won't explain it in detail, um, but would encourage you to read the guidance uh, from the Global Protection Cluster and AORs on the, the protection of the local framework. Um, but basically, we structure our data like we would organize a wardrobe. So everything on this we put here, everything on this we put there. Um, that is basically the logic. So here are a few pieces of text. And so um, let's imagine they all came from different reports. So for example, on point three, I saw that intercommunal violence stands out as a major source of insecurity. In the first quarter, more than 92% of overall citizen casualties resulted from intercommunal violence perpetrated by community-based militias and civil defense groups. This was from OCHA. Um, then also I have point five, random attacks by armed cattle keepers and cattle raids on civilians continue unabated uh, and affect both remote areas. So this was from an NGO uh, report. And so these pieces of text I thought were important because they speak about risk, they speak about intercommunal violence, about uh, cattle raiding. And so these are risks or protection issues that I want to make sure I keep in mind when we write our qualitative analysis. So what we do is we basically take the protection and local framework and we map our pieces of data. So these are the same text that you saw on the previous slide against this framework. So we basically organize them in our little wardrobe and say this stays here, this stays there, this stays there. Now, this is only an example of us doing this with four pieces of text um, and this is manual. So this is quite a lot of work. Um, and particularly the more data you have, the more pieces of text you will need to fit. Um, and so it becomes a bit unwieldy pretty quickly um, if we do it like this. So what we are using in this project is called the DEEP, the Data Entry and Exploration Platform, that we use to structure data. Um, you can go to the DEEP yourself if you want to have a look. You can sign up. Um, 
of course, you're not part of any projects, but um, the platform is free um, to access. Um, <clears throat> basically, I will just through the screenshot kind of show the logic, but we basically save pieces of text from different assessments that we find important. So here there's a piece highlighted on the left um, that starts with in the fourth quarter of 2023. And so I select this piece of text because I think I need to use it. And then I start clicking different boxes where I want to put it. So this is the protection and local framework. So I say this is part of protection threats and I click that and then I save it so that um, once I need to pull, uh, if Dorian would ask me, or actually in this case, he would ask Nor, you know, what is the information on, um, I don't know, the number of civilians injured, for example, in the past quarter, we can go through what have we saved under threats and then find these pieces of information back. That would basically be the logic. And so um, there's different, what we call tagging, so different um, pieces of uh, um, boxes that we click to save this information um, and so we use it against the protection and local framework but we can also put the geographical location um, so in this case this piece of text is talking about um, greater upper nile so if um, somebody would ask hey what is all the latest information that you can find on what happened in the greater upper nile we just go to whatever was saved under greater upper nile and we can pull all of that so um, this is how we use it. We use an online platform to save all our secondary data and to structure it so that we can pull it when we need it, basically. So in terms of processing our data um, or what we call tagging on deep, um, some tips and lessons that we found is that um, we organize our data against the protection and the local framework. So this threat, threat effect capacities, um, which this framework is very well known with our cluster colleagues for sure. Um, what we have found is that doing that in itself is not sufficient. So if I just look at everything that is threats, um, I can still get thousands of sources really, or thousands of pieces of text that we saved. Um, and so what we have found is that structuring your data against polit uh, the protection and local framework is one thing, but we also need to immediately structure it according to one of these 15 protection risks to ensure that um, we talk more on the protection risk language. So it's more, what can we find on attacks against civilians or what can we find on GBV or what qualitative or secondary reports um, or pieces of text can we find on um, trafficking, for example. So we structure it simultaneously against risks because that's easier um, to, to present the data and also to find what we need. Um, structuring qualitative data is um, complex in the sense that different people can structure it differently. Um, so as you know, the analytical framework is very helpful in guiding us through these threats, what are the effects, what are the capacities, um, but the interpretation of how something needs to be structured can be different. So if there's multiple people working on structuring qualitative data or um, making sure that you have your qualitative data ready to use for whenever. Um, it is important that these people at least have the same definition as to what they're doing, um, because then when you pull the data, you need to obviously know what it means and how you've structured it. Um, so that takes uh, resources. And so also the understanding within, um, you know, two people's different brains might be different. Um, and again, um, I emphasized it before, but to keep doing this and doing this in a structured manner, there needs to be some sort of data pro um, sharing process that needs to be established within the cluster, whether that is keeping um, abreast on the latest uh, assessments that are done, whether it is a standing item in the cluster meeting on you know, what partners are doing and what assessments might be coming out or what's being planned, whether that is sharing through mailing lists, um, but there needs to be some sort of continuous and or regular um, information flow also for the latest qualitative reports as you would, for example, present your protection monitoring data every month. Last but not least, oops, sorry, um, that was a little bit uneven. Um, that is basically the process of what we're doing. So we're looking at all the reports that are coming out, we're mapping all our information sources that are coming out, and we're structuring this data within this online platform to basically ensure that we can pull whenever we need it. 
Um, and then complement this, for example, in South Sudan's case with primary data collection on the protection monitoring, we put all these together and um, then have an update for an analytical product, whether that is a monthly report that comes out with both stats and text um, and people's interpretation on what this actually means, um, or whether this is for the um, protection analysis updates um, that are being done in the cluster, where we do the same process, but on a somewhat bigger scale where we take whatever we can find on the qualitative side, on the quantitative side, and have people discuss this together um, over the course of a few days to come up with a joint analysis of the main protection risks. Um, so to maybe end up with some lessons learned on the whole process in general. Um, so planning for leading and coordinating the analysis workflow. So both quantitative and qualitative, um, but in general, making sure that this happens consistently and also that the, you know, the writing is done, the summaries, for example, so that you have something to discuss is time and resource uh, consuming. Um, so there is no doubt about that. Um, just like in quantitative data collection, where you need to set up the whole assessment, you need to collect all the data, somebody needs to crunch the stats and present that. The same way on the qualitative side, you do need dedicated human resources to structure information and write summaries so that you actually have something to discuss. Um, of course, if you do this um, less uh, frequently, then, um, to, for example, if you do it once a year, it's going to be also very time and resource consuming because you have so much data to go through. So we do think it reduces the overall amount of work when this is done on a regular basis. But either way, um, it's going to require some dedicated human resources to get this done. Um, in general, for the analysis workflow, what we've seen, it's best when it's um, specifically someone's responsibility. Um, so, for example, when there is a clear division within the cluster team as to who is, let's say, responsible for the analysis workflow. Um, so this could be the co-coordinator, it can be the coordinator, it can be the IMO, um, but we've seen that it works best when somebody assumes this responsibility for this analysis workflow, whether that's quantitative, qualitative, or both, um, to push that forward. But also, for example, um, as South Sudan is doing it, when this is situated within an analysis working group, um, where there's a dedicated working group under the cluster that is then charged with um, looking at both the quantitative and qualitative data and jointly deciding on this is what we're putting forward. Um, so some formalized system either with a person's uh, responsibility and or with a group within the cluster's responsibility um, seems to be um, a successful formula. Um, we've also seen that in general, um, whether this is quantitative or qualitative, um, when it comes to making an analytical products, um, including the protection analysis update, some form of joint analysis is needed to create consensus, um, but also to interpret the data. So um, the drivers, the, you know, the threats, what are the consequences? A lot of these concepts are very interlinked. And so um, it tends to help to have some form of joint analysis process with people, um, cluster partners, to decide on what it is that we're putting forward. And um, the last lesson learned that we have seen is so through structuring your qualitative data um, frequently and through a process like this, we can improve on the efficiency. Um, so as I said, it will take human resources, but to then pull your data when it's needed is very efficient. Um, so we don't do this just for one product. We can do this regularly. If it's a new um, uh, report that comes out or a report for a special representative that needs to be done and, and we need to talk about, oh, what's the risk for GBV, we can continuously just pull whatever is in there, which is quite an efficient process uh, once everything is structured. And the structuring itself, like I said, takes time and resources, but then over time it takes less and less because it's not like you're going to have, you know, 50 new protection assessments coming out every month, right? So over time, the work that you need to do in structuring your data becomes less. Um, it also helps in creating this evidence-based discussions. Um, so, for example, as Dorian showed with the PROMO working group, there's a quantitative data side, the qualitative data side, and the people discussing it, uh, which is the same format we're doing in this joint analysis workshops. 
Um, and I think um, for what we've seen is that, you know, you could say 30% of key informants say that this is a big risk. Um, but then there, the, the, the interpretation or the context in that sense is missing. That we can bring in from the qualitative side. And it's easier to have people sometimes just discuss a narrative. So um, you build a narrative about, you know, the protection risk consists of this and this and this based off your qualitative data. And 30% of key informants um, say the, the same thing. But then you can build more of a narrative around what is the risk that we're talking about? Uh, why is this happening? And have people debate that. Um, and it's easier to create this evidence based discussion based on both data combined than on, for example, debating whether 30% is correct or whether it means something else. Um, so that also gives a bit more room for nuance, for contextualization, um, and also just for interpretation of um, the facts and, and figures. So these are um, the lessons or main lessons that we've seen from throughout this process and from working with the protection clusters. Um, and yeah, it's been really good learning. It's been a really good experience working with our protection cluster colleagues on this and seeing um, how we can best structure these processes to, to help do analysis over time. So I think with that, um, if there are any questions, if there's any feedback, if there's any um, anything that you want to share, um, please feel free to do so. You can raise your hand and then um, we're happy to hear any of your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, Mikhailo or Mikhailo? Um, I could see your hand, but I can't hear you speaking. Did you want to ask a question? Sorry, it was by mistake. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Okay. Joel, I see your hand. You can hear me. Hi, I hope you can yes, hear me. I, I just wanted me. to thank you, Frey, and thank your team. Um, uh, we, of course, at the Deep Secretariat here and with all of our partners around the world, we appreciate the use of the tool, um, all of the collective feedback, you know, and especially that great lessons learned uh, from colleagues in South Sudan. So, Frey, thank you so much. Just an intervention and over to you and the team. Thanks, Joel. Appreciate it. So, yeah, Joel is um, part of the, uh, well, he's the deep manager. Uh, so he manages this platform uh, or at least the group behind this platform, let's put it that way. Um, and so we are using this for protection analysis, but the platform can also be used for structuring qualitative data for different purposes. Um, and so we are doing this with protection clusters, but um, there's many colleagues within the humanitarian community around the world that are using this for um, different types of analysis to maybe give some feedback on that. Okay, are there any questions from anyone? And um, otherwise, I think we can end at the hour and I see a lot of hands. Okay, I see Serena, Serena. Yes, uh, Frederick, maybe one question um, or maybe, yeah. So I was wondering if I understand correctly, uh, also the secondary quality analysis should be done quite regularly. Otherwise, as I understand, you would basically have a gap in information because I, I get this um, deep platform. Basically, I can register 
and then it would be like my own account, right? So I'm myself with my organization, I'm feeding data onto that platform. So ideally, um, we need to do this work with a, in a regular fashion, so not to have a gap in information, and so that if we want to analyze a specific uh, protection threat, or then we would have um, a good overview over the year or over a time period, right? This is one first question. And then secondly, um, do you have any, I understand also you were talking about like a protracted crisis or maybe a new onset, um, but I was wondering if you had like a suggestion on what kind of uh, maybe sources you would look at or uh, where you found um, like good quality and interesting information, let's say beyond uh, the news. Yeah, thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, so as to the first part of the question regarding the deep platform, so um, yeah, we didn't show this platform in detail, um, but indeed that would be the logic behind it that um, like if you would be doing, for example, protection monitoring or your DTM assessment, you know, on a monthly or at least quarterly basis, the idea would be to also look through all the reports that are coming out um, and by reports, indeed, it could be anything, right? News articles or or anything like that on a regular basis and save the information that you need from these sources um, so that when you need to write a report, um, you can pull that information regularly. So yes, that would be the idea. And the reason why it's structured within the clusters is because obviously um, as the cluster, we're trying to coordinate and, and work together and collaborate among partners. Um, and so, um, but you can also do this for your own organization, of course. Um, so yeah, um, I hope that answers the first part of your question, but yes, the idea would be to do that regularly and frequently. Um, secondly, when it comes in terms of sources, so for protection analysis, um, we have, uh, let's say your your usual suspects in terms of sources that you would find in most countries um, that could be um, again protection monitoring um, a lot of DTM reports that might be coming out um, UNHCR updates it can be um, particularly within the cluster of course again what your partners are doing so partner assessments etc that we um, that we look at um, but then on top of that, um, it depends a little bit on the country, of course. Um, within some countries, we have a few news um, outlets that we know uh, we need to monitor every now and again because they might provide more, you know, in-depth information on the latest news, etc. Um, it could be um, more like think tank type of platforms. So uh, we look a lot at anything that human rights watch might produce, anything that could come from platforms such as um, you know, strategic studies institutes. Um, there's a lot of these type of think tanks on 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 foreign affairs that might come out with a lot of um, analysis on conflict drivers, underlying things. Um, so I think those kind of things to more understand more about context dynamics, what could be drivers, effects, etc. Um, and then with, from within our partners, so from the humanitarian community, really more on um, the latest, you know, needs, how that's evolving, etc. Um, and by partners, I focus a lot on the protection cluster partners um, because this is protection analysis. But having said that, any type of uh, partner update could be useful, right? So uh, food security support uh, reports can also contain information that we need for protection. Uh, wash updates can also contain information that we need for protection. Um, so we we tend to look a lot at like the intersectoral aspects. So um, OCHA, SITREPS, those type of things. But if there are major reports coming out from other partners within the humanitarian community, we would definitely also save those and go through that information and systematically tag that according to protection risk and the analytical framework. So I hope that gives you a bit more ideas. Um, Adriana? Oh. Uh, hello? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you for, for, this, uh, for this presentation. I think it's very useful 
in in how to structure the the data that we have especially now that we are starting the the a channel process and uh, i am i am all for for protection cluster in, in venezuela and we are uh, now gathering all the information that that we have and the secondary data and i think uh, your lessons learned will be will be very useful for us uh, i have a question uh, regarding uh, deep specifically and because I understand there are two two stages in the process of of, uh, of analysis uh, as I see it and one one of the stages is more uh, let's say uh, automatic uh, regarding tagging the the information like uh, classifying the information and and my question was uh, and also considering that there may be some people from deep in the in the call as you mentioned if uh, it's been <clears throat> uh, considered uh, to use uh, artificial intelligence in the process of of tagging uh, i i i see that there are like there is like more like an automated process and then there's more like interpretation process where of course uh, artificial intelligence could not play a, a role but maybe in the first part uh you like the the and of course with a human uh then revision of the process if this has been evaluated over thank you Sure. Um, thanks for that question. So basically the first part about um, how there's, let's say, different stages of using this deep platform. Um, so again, we're using this platform to structure our data and to save content that we need from our secondary reports and to make sure that we um, do it in such a way that we can basically use it whenever we need it. Um, so maybe I will ask um, Bunny or Noor, um, the analysts for East and West Africa, if they want to come in on this process. And then maybe um, Joel, if you're still online, um, if you want to um, say a few words on this um, automation. I'm not sure if I see Joel, so maybe I'll come in after that as well. But I'll first hand over to Funny or Noor to also talk a little bit more about this structuring on Deep. Yeah, um, I, I can come uh, on board. Um, regarding this automatization process, I mean, it's something that uh, we're developing now. It's from my knowledge and my understanding of a platform, it's not uh, yet really um, put in place. Uh, you still do the tagging parts and then you export according to that. Um, but it's not developed yet. I don't know if no, you have complementary information. Hello, hi. Um, um, no, in terms of the stages, I, uh, I, I don't have a question. I don't have an answer for the artificial intelligence. I guess it's being developed, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't answer to that. But in terms of the stages of of tagging, um, basically it depends what is the the process that you have for tagging. So as we have mentioned before, it does need some human resources to be put behind it. So if you're doing, if you're collecting and uploading on a weekly basis and then tagging every every week or every month i think every week is a mm. bit much but maybe every month um that could be your own process so i think what helps with deep is understanding why you're using it and how you're using it so what is the end product that you're trying to do um it makes the the tagging better but also it puts the structure of the tagging into whatever stages that you need yeah, and the, the extent of the source you want to monitor as well, if you just want to focus on specific sources related to your specific sector, or if you also want to go broadly uh, about having like a media monitoring or over, over aspects. So it's it really, if you want to avoid those gaps, yeah, you have to put that in place regularly, but it also depends on the amount of data you want to, to cover with the DIP. Yeah. So then maybe a little bit on the automation, um, Adriana. So um, basically, um, we are using a deep to do to use our data against the protection and local framework. There are other frameworks that you can build in deep. Um, so uh, let's say an entity like OCHA, 
um, while I'm sure they're very interested in protection analysis, would have a more of a broader outlook as well. So they use what we call, let's say, a generic analysis framework. So they also look at like wash needs, food needs, etc. Um, so there is uh, there are developments in using NLP, so um, let's say automated language to extract um, information. Um, to my knowledge, this is used uh, not necessarily currently on the protection of the local framework, but more on um, tested on other um, data and frameworks. Um, I'm not sure as to the status of that currently um, and or what the development is going to be in that, but um, perhaps with um, the materials that we can send out, we can ask a quick update from our deep colleagues on that to also include that in the, in the answer. Um, Runt. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the informative uh, slides. Uh, I tried to uh, log in into the DEEP uh, website, uh, and I noticed that um, we can build our project and select what geographical, uh, geographical areas we're going to work in and so on. Uh, and I, uh, I just want to check that where we can uh, see, uh, let's say, um, a previous uh, uh, analysis on it or access to uh, analytical uh, reports built on uh, this website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think what we could potentially look at is to add you to a training project that we have done. Um, I think for us, Maybe just the caveat, um, the system itself doesn't produce an analytical report. The system itself can give us outputs of how we have structured our data. So if I look up anything for a certain location, it will give me everything that I've saved under there. If I look up um, anything for a certain protection risk, it will give me all the information that I've saved under there. So the pieces of information that we need to keep, plus all the sources that, um, that we have um, saved basically. So it will say this piece of text is saved under here. This is the author. Here's the report, right? Um, so just a little caveat that we're using it to structure and organize our data. Unfortunately, like all analysis processes, in order to do analysis, we will have to um, use our brain. Like we, we will have to do the writing, right? So the summaries that I showed um, are based off all the information that we save through the system. Um, but that also does require our own writing um, to structure to to present it in a way that um, the way yeah the way that I I showed it on on the screen. Um, but so there are test projects. So if you're now um, obviously signing up to the system, you don't have your own project. Um, so you can of course start a new one to play around. But I do think there are some test projects. So um, maybe Funny or Nor can invite you. Um, to to one of those test projects, so you can at least see a little bit um, what it looks like um, if there would be data on there, let's say. Okay, any last questions? Great. Well, then I would like to thank you all for your time today. Thank you for joining this webinar. Thank you for your questions, your engagement. Um, we hope it was useful for you. We hope you found it interesting. Um, and of course, if you have any further questions or want to know everything, you are uh, free to reach out to, to any of us on the panel today. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. So thank you very much and have a great day.